Lovely, isn't it? So natural and so peaceful. It's hard to imagine these stately homes being set in anything other than traditional English countryside. You'd think they had always looked like this. Well, you'd be wrong. These landscapes were created over 200 years ago with a great deal of money, a lot of hard work, and the talent of one outstanding man, Capability Brown. For if you were anybody who was anybody in the 18th century, engaging Capability Brown to landscape your estate was an absolute must. He was the height of fashion. The cream of the aristocracy fought for his services. He could transform the dullest piece of land into a thing of beauty. He would survey the most unpromising ground and assure his patrons that there were great capabilities there, my lord, great capabilities. <laughs> This view, across the lake at Blenheim Palace, has been called the finest view in England. Admittedly by Winston Churchill's parents, who had a vested interest in it. But it's entirely man-made. Capability Brown was at the height of his career when he created it for the fourth Duke of Marlborough. A landscape like this one told the world three very important things about yourself. Firstly, that you had taste. Secondly, that you moved in the right circles. And thirdly, that you were extremely wealthy. Perhaps one of the 400 families who owned over a quarter of England. All in all, it was no mean accomplishment for a man who'd been born in the small Northumbrian village of Kirkhall 48 years before. His family were yeoman farmers, and Lancelot Brown, for that is what he was christened, was one of six children who grew up in the heart of the countryside. The most impressive quality about Northumberland is its sense of openness and space, the sense of acres rather than yards. And every day on his two-mile walk to school, the natural grandeur of these open spaces were etched on his mind. Lancelot Brown left school at 16 after an unusually long and thorough education for the times. His first job was as a gardener's boy with a local landowner, Sir William Lorraine, who was smitten with the fever of the day, land and house alteration. Anyone with any money seemed to relish our people in those days. Can't think why. Sir William remodelled his house to form an imposing square. Sadly, there's only the servants' quarters left now. It was the age of the grand gesture. Moving the village out of sight of the house was to become commonplace. Sir William was keen on land improvements. He planted over half a million trees on his estate and made this valley out of a desolate bog. This is probably Brown's very first landscape. What's so remarkable about it is that it shows that he had the ability and confidence to tackle large-scale works from the beginning. Domesticity never held any interest for him. Landscaping was his forte. And throughout the 18th century, the aristocracy positively queued for his services. So how did Capability Brown manage to meet the noblest in the land? Northumberland wasn't the centre of fashion. So the only course open to him was to travel south. Luck played its part, as it so often did for Brown. Sir William's wife, Lady Lorraine, wrote to her father. He secured Brown a job in Oxfordshire. And by the very next year, he had landed the plum job in England. At 24, he became head gardener here at Stowe. the centre of the gardening universe, the undisputed leader of fashion. It was owned by Viscount Cobham, 
to whom fortune had sent a very wealthy wife, but dismissal from political office. So he had plenty of time and money to indulge his overriding passion, gardening. A contemporary writer could look about the social scene and conclude, every man now, be his fortune what it will, is to be doing something at his place, as the fashionable phrase is. And you hardly meet with anybody who, after the first compliments, does not inform you that he is in mortar and moving of earth, the modest terms for building and gardening. One large room, a serpentine river, and a wood are become the absolute necessities of life, without which a gentleman of the smallest fortune thinks he makes no figure in the country. Well, Viscount Cobham certainly did make a figure in the country, but he didn't make do with one large room, a serpentine river, and a wood. He spent money like water. It cascaded through his hands. By coming here, Brown had landed on his feet. Viscount Cobham's motto could have been off with the old and on with the new. He was always experimenting. His first garden designer was Charles Bridgman. He believed in strict formality. No curves or wayward lines greeted Lord and Lady Cobham's eye as they sat on the portico. Instead, they looked onto a regular garden known as the Great Parterre. It was really an outdoor room where you could promenade and show off your finery. A parterre was a very important feature at the beginning of the 18th century. Further away from Stowe House was a regular shaped lake and an almost military arrangement of avenues and trees. It was the gardener who took over from Bridgman, William Kent, who began the revolution in gardening. He broke away from formality and allowed paths and lawns to curve. Brown worked under him, executing his ideas. One of the first jobs he was given was getting rid of the great parterre and replacing it with grass. It was the beginning of the gardening style that we think of as being natural, but it is as contrived as the formality it had replaced. George Clark has made a study of Stowe. The legend is that he came in as a uh, tramped in with his, his uh, belongings and a handkerchief and joined the kitchen garden staff and was spotted and uh, uh, went up the ladder and was promoted by my lord. A real rags to riches story. Only ten more miles to Stowe. That's it. That's it. <laughs> but in fact, we now know and have known for some time that this, this, this is wrong. Lord Cobham appointed him to the position of head gardener at Stowe at the age of 24. So Brown came, I can give you the date, it's, it's uh, 11th of March 1741, and at the age of 24 he had something like 35 to 40 men under him. Of course there was an experienced steward over him, the steward, the, the, the manager, the man who runs the whole estate, and his name was Roberts, and uh, after six months, for reasons we don't know, Roberts hanged himself. Oh. And so it was an appalling managerial crisis. Next week, the Prince of Wales was coming. You can imagine the fuss. Uh, we don't know what happened, but they got through that. And Brown, by this time, must have been just 25, August 1741. And at that moment, they appointed a new manager called Potts, good down-to-earth name, Thomas Potts. And Thomas Potts was there for a year, and bit by bit, it's evident that things are going wrong. And after a year, in 1742, Potts vanishes with the cash, and Potts goes, and only Brown is left. And so here is Brown, by this time he must be fully 26, and he steps into the breach. And instead of just being head gardener and running the work of, of uh, 40 men, he takes on everything. I counted it up. In the year that he took over, he had something like nine different projects being undertaken. Mm -hmm. In the house, there was a, the chapel and the library. They were redoing the stables and the uh, stable court and the um, wagon house. And in the gardens, they were finishing the Gothic temple and the ladies' temple and the grotto and the keeper's tower. That's nine. And Brown ran the lot. Mr. Brown was capable only of success. Whilst not designing them, he supervised the building of many of the 32 temples and follies in the grounds. 
My favourite has to be the Gothic Temple, a delightful place for afternoon tea. During the 18th century, pictures by Claude Lorraine and Poussin were coming into the country. They showed an idealised classical landscape. The fashion was to try and recreate it, so Viscount Cobham and Kent designed the Elysian Fields. All the temples and columns were supposed to make artful pictures. It was all new when Brown came, and it was a lesson in fluidity. The series ends with the Temple of British Worthies. How important was Brown's time here at Stowe, do you think, oh, to, to his future career? Crucial in all sorts of ways. What sort of a man do you think he was? Well, in one word, very capable. <laughs> I, you must remember that life on a, in a great house is very different then from what it is now. You only came here in May, all the servants were pushed ahead, and they come in May and the family comes down for the summer. They would be hosts, a huge scale, to all sorts of friends who came visiting for weeks at a time, and they would be taken round. And Brown, obviously, would be hauled in, the man who understood it, and who had, had a way, he could get on with people. So Brown met the people who were going to employ him later on. Most of the work was done in the winter. It could take up to 200 men, women and children for a particular project, and the men were paid the princely sum of sixpence a day. The place above all else that is connected with Brown is the Grecian Valley. And here, Viscount Cobham's wealth literally caused the earth to move. Tons and tons of it. It was all dug out by hand and carted away. It gave the valley the undulating feel that was to be repeated so often in Brown's later landscapes. It didn't look exactly like this when it was first laid out, but it did have the wavy lines of trees down each side. What it did look like was this. There were clumps of trees artfully scattered throughout, paths to stroll on and a column to elevate the mind. It was all supposed to look like Arcadia, heaven for the few. Brown was soon to become essential to them to help them maintain their standards. An Oxford historian who's closely studied the period that produced these works is Keith Thomas. The 18th century aristocracy, I think, thought that their authority rested not just on wealth and power, but on an innate superiority of discrimination. And one of the ways they demonstrated that superiority was by laying out their grounds around their houses in a manner which seemed uh, tasteful. That is to say, was in accordance with the latest fashion. Although some of the aristocrats were great arbiters of taste themselves, most of them had to buy it from an expert. And so they brought in the dancing masters who told them how to move and the tailors who told them how to dress, and the architects who told them what their houses should look like, and the landscape gardeners who told them how to lay out their grounds. In the 18th century aristocracy were very subtle in the way they displayed their taste. I mean, they didn't flaunt their wealth in a brash way. Beau Brummel said that the uh, only differ the difference between a gentleman's suit and an ordinary suit should be so subtle that only a gentleman could recognize it. And the same might be true of Brown's landscapes. And the reason that Brown is overwhelmed with uh, demands from hundreds of uh, gentry and aristocrats is that he is the authority on what is fashionable and what is tasteful. Viscount Cobham died in 1749. It marked the end of an era. Perhaps his richest legacy was a fully trained head gardener whose ideas had been imbued with the spirit of Stowe. Brown was now jack of all trades and master of them all. Occasionally during Cobham's lifetime, he had been lent to neighboring estates and his fame as an innovator was increasingly being recognized. For the two years after Cobham's death until Brown left for London, he freelanced from here. His most important commission was undoubtedly that undertaken for the sixth Earl of Coventry at Croom Court in Worcestershire. Brown's work at Stowe had made him familiar in dealing with masons, painters, and plasterers. He had had enough experience of building to now think of himself as an architect as well as a landscape gardener. He could provide his clients with the complete package deal for homes and gardens. He called this placemaking. The 
The Earl knew that the house lay in as hopeless a sight as any in the British Isles, as it was waterlogged. Brown's first job was to drain the land, and extensive culverts were laid just below the lawn to carry the water to the artificial river he made. It's all a bit sad now. It looks more like a refuge for wildlife than the setting for a glittering social pageant. In its heyday, it looked brilliant, and such was its charm that Lord Coventry built a lakeside memorial to the memory of Lancelot Brown, who, by the power of his inimitable and creative genius, formed this garden scene out of a morass. Brown had an uncanny ability to develop a perfect understanding with his patrons and could hobnob with ease with the highest of the high. Lord Coventry could invite him for a Christmas gamble, the Duke of Marlborough to dinner, and statesmen like the Earl of Chatham could order him, go you and adorn England. The land was important to the 18th century aristocracy because it was the basis of their political power. Their authority rested on their dominance in the localities. It is very remarkable, I think, that in the 18th century, which was a time of very rapid change, social change and technological change, when most consumer goods changed each year in accordance with the latest fashion, when clothes changed, that these people set out to design these timeless Arcadian landscapes which were meant to last forever. Brown hit a winning formula right at the beginning of his career and had the good sense never to vary it very much. It was a winning streak that never ran out. He became known as the dictator of taste. Here, at Petworth House, begun at the same time as Croom Court, you can see why. <laughs> Perfection itself, complete harmony between man and nature. Here are the classic features. The belt of woodland, so useful for hiding the farms from view or land that didn't belong to you. And these clumps of trees, carefully arranged to draw your eye right across your land to your distant horizon. And this graceful serpentine lake, his hallmark. A brown landscape needed water, either a river or better still a lake. But the problem with water is how do you stop it draining away through the soil, never to be seen again? Well, the answer is clay. Lots of it. You work it up with water till it gets to a sticky constituency. It's called puddling. It's very messy. Brown's workmen used to do it with their feet. You then spread a layer over the area where you want your lake. And it keeps the water in. It's fortunate it worked. A lake like this took two years to build, but news of its charm spread quickly. Throughout his life, Brown was a workaholic. He was almost incapable of saying no to a commission, and although he suffered from chronic asthma and travelling conditions were abysmal, his enthusiasm never flagged. By now, Brown's list of clients read like a roll call of the House of Lords. The length and breadth of England was coming under his influence. It was a period of great prosperity for the country. New wealth was flowing in from the colonies, and vast fortunes were being made. In Yorkshire, Edwin Lassells commissioned a new house and grounds. Only the finest craftsmen of the day matched his standards. Naturally, Lancelot Brown was amongst them, to the delight of the present Earl of Harwood. Your land stretches as far as the eye can see. How much 
of this is Brown's responsibility? I think everything we can see really is the lake, for instance, was a stream uh, and he was part of the team that was responsible for damming it and making it into a lake. All the planting was his scheme, his outline, and I think very little of it was like that before. See, he changed so much, didn't he? He, he moved earth a lot. I, think so. I find that extraordinary. Yes, yeah, without Buddha. <laughs> no, JCB. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. I think that's very remarkable. Yes. Yeah. I wonder how many times he would have visited here. It's very hard to know. How many places did he design? 100 and, 150? About, about 140, 150, yes. yes. He can't have come very often, can he? Because no, it was a long way from one to another. He had dreadful asthma. So, he did, yes. Yeah, so yes. he's been wheezing up the A1. Yes. <laughs> and when he stayed, would he have stayed in the house? Do you think? I think he must have, yes. So yes, I would have thought he would. It's he a very good question. I would have thought he did. I think he obviously had enormous ambition, uh, because this is what he did well, he wanted to do it. But all of the people involved in that kind of planning must have had quite a lot of far-sightedness and in a funny way, unselfishness, because you couldn't see the results. No, that's you could see what had been done, and you knew what in a hundred years, or right, 75 years, would happen. Your grandchildren could see it. Yes. But you yes. wouldn't. You'd only yeah. see the outline of it. You'd only see the new plantation. I believe you had an horrendous storm here in 1962 and lost an awful lot of trees. We lost something like 20,000 mature trees, which is more than you can easily afford, at least certainly more than the capability brown landscape can afford. And that was a misery because it was ooh, two storms of about a couple of hours each, something like that. Uh, freak storms, kind of tornadoes, and they shoved the trees in every direction. They didn't all fall at one way. What it looked like was like those photographs of a battle in the First War, of a shelling, a bombardment, where trees were knocked in every direction, many of them broken off 15, 20 foot high. That was the amazing thing. They were just snapped off like that. It was horrible. Really. Actually horrible. Uh, it was awful clearing it. I have for years, and I'm just getting over it, had the sin of envy. I know exactly what that feels like, watching, looking at other people's beautiful stands of timber, wonderful, untouched, unblemished timber, and comparing it with what used to be very nice woods here, which had been destroyed by it. And we did try and plant them up, more or less, as they'd been before. Of course, it's taken time. What Brown have known, do you think, that trees only were lasting for about 200 years? Oh, yeah. Do you think he would have done? But 200 years is a nice long time. We're yes. not planting for 2,200. No. Not no. specifically. No, I hope no exactly. Can last that long, exactly. Not... Why do you think we're standing here 200 years on and still talking about Gabriel Brown's landscape? I suppose I answer the question to myself by um, constantly looking out of the window here when I ought to be doing something more profitable, um, watching Odd enough, the spring shadows are the best as the sun sets, the shadows going across the landscape and thinking it looks great. And then I think one wonders what those quite gentle, rather ordinary hills would have looked like before he started to, what, highlight them, to show them up. It's really like, uh, like lighting a set, isn't it, what he right. did? Right. Uh, there is a certain theatricality about it. He did it on purpose to make foreground and middle ground and distance, so to speak, all that he highlighted. And I think as the light changes over it, one sees that, and at least you sense it, even if you can't always define it, as well as he could. And obviously that's what he was marvelous at, from the number of, of commissions he accepted and brought off, and actually looking at it and saying, that's what we can do, that's what it'll look like, that's what will improve it, that's what will give distance, that's what will give excitement. Perhaps drama, he never writes about drama, does he? No, he doesn't. That's what he means. Chatsworth House in Derbyshire, a most suitable case for Brown's treatment. The present Duke of Devonshire feels that its inauspicious Elizabethan beginnings give very little hint of the glories to come. Can you tell me what the landscape was like here before Capability to Brown came? Well, it was much barer and much bleaker. Uh, you see, you planted uh, the trees from which, most of the trees from which uh, we see here. Uh, there was a theory in those days that trees wouldn't grow in North Derbyshire 
and uh, he certainly proved that they could and have done fairly well, as you can see from here. Before, it was bare and bleak, and he planted, I say, a to all the trees we see from here, but uh, he did plant a very large number, both behind me and at the view I'm looking at. Do you still have Gabriel de Brown's plans? Uh, no, can't find them. One day they will be found. Uh, this house was a girls' school in the war, and the whole house, which was completely lived in, um, all of it, and when it was full, there were 100 people living in it, and the whole house completely was packed up in 11 days. Heaven. And uh, I don't think it's ever really been completely unpacked since. <laughs> so one day we may, we, we may, find, we may find this plan. Luckily, there are still plans of the 17th century garden, when Chatsworth conformed to the ordered spirit of the day. In front, uh, there was a parterre garden, very much in the French style, low clipped hedges, and uh, he did away with all that. There was also parterre of... Oh, really? Those That's lots, a yes. And here I, uh, my wife, who knows a great deal about capability crowd, here uh, she and I disagree. I like those big lawns. She would prefer to, to keep uh, the parterre. He did it really, I think, to uh, enhance uh, the cascade. He felt that the detail of a part of garden on those lawns distracted attention away from the cascade and he re they replaced it by lawn. The celebrated cascade was built in 1694 and has flowed ever since. The Duchess of Devonshire has strong views on Brown's remodelling. Over here, now we see all that. Is that all Capability Brown's idea? Yes, I think it's him and the fourth Duke of Devonshire working together. They enclosed that huge bit of ground to make a park, as you see as it is now. And then what Brown did, which was very clever, was to plant the rim up there. And more than that, to make it a nice sort of enclosed feeling, he did it in wedge-shaped bits so that when one bit comes to be cut down, there's another bit growing up, so you don't feel a big gap. Because trees last what, 150, 200 that years? That sort of thing, and then so they've got to be cut down, that's what... So is there an awful lot of replanting going to happen always, very soon? Always, always cut yes. and replanting, yes. Yeah. Yes. He also, I believe, changed the course of, of the river. Yes, he did. He did that to make a better view from the house, because the ground was too steep here, he thought. Mm -hmm. And so then they changed that, but what I'm always thankful for is he doesn't stop up the river and make one of those awful false lakes. Which one always imagines is what he most of all liked doing. Well, it was his favourite trick. Wasn't it? Really yes. It was. Yes. But oh, really. I must say, not my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> like it rains too much. You don't want to see rain coming down into a lake. No, no, exactly. You're right, having a river. It's the real thing. It's getting rid of the water instead That's of adding right. it. That's right. Yes. Do you like what he did? Well, I think what he did in the park is, is genius. And I, think, and I think he was sort of the, really the inventor of English parks, which are unique in the world and wonderful uh, to look at and to walk about in or whatever you like. But when it came to gardening, I really deplore what he did. Right. <laughs> so had he, had he landscaped all this? Well, he had nothing to do with actually this bit of garden. He didn't. But w there was a wonderful formal garden above with fountains and uh, parterres and all that. And he just swept that away and made... Uh, sloping lawns, which which is really sad, because I think a house of this kind, which is very grand and architectural, really needs the architecture to come into the garden and needs all those hedges. When the Duke found out about Capability Brown, yes. Capability Brown was the thing of the moment. That's so it. he probably didn't think what it would look like at Chatsworth, it was just that everybody had to have Capability Brown, was that it? Well, you know what fashion is? It's such a strong thing, isn't it? It comes sort of in the air, and everybody wants the same thing at the same time. That's right. And I suppose it was all friends, word of mouth, and they all said, this is a brilliant man who can make marvellous park and change your garden and make it very fashionable. But I suppose in the 18th century, you didn't worry about money, did you? No, I don't really? think so, no, no. You I, know. Think, I think definitely not. It seems the most extraordinary age when people were there to build beautiful, well, I mean, I know this house was built before then, but to create these amazing gardens, and the wealth was so unevenly divided. Would you like to have been, have been around then? No, no, because I'm terrified of my anaesthetic when I go to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose from the point of view of creating things, yes, because that was a time of wonderful taste when 
ugly, there wasn't nothing ugly made. And the local grandee was a local dictator. He could have done what he liked, when he liked, no planning permission. It just happened. I find it extraordinary that someone like Gabriel de Brown, coming from a little village in Northumberland, should end up creating all this. He must have been a sort of a genius, but he must have had a, a sort of inner something. And he obviously was very clever, had great charm, and people loved working with him. Why do you think that his work and these beautiful views that we look at have lasted so long? I think because they're completely English and there's something that only happens in England. An English park is uh, peculiar to this country. And I think that it's incredibly pleasant. And uh, I suppose that's why, but I do think he was extraordinary to see what it was going to look like in 150, 200 years. That, that was amazing. Yes. Was terrible, wasn't it? That thing that amazes me, I, I plant a seed and know that it'll be in flower come, come the summer, and I'm thrilled about like that. that. <laughs> yes, exactly. But to be able to just plant trees, and they must have been how high, I wonder, probably about 10 or 20 foot. No less, I guess, then you, yes. they were going to last, especially in a climate like this. And they end, end up looking at something like that. Well, it was, it was, it was inspired, inspired genius in the park, I do think. Do you, I, I bet he was a bit of a martinet. I bet. Otherwise, he couldn't have got it done. But I think anybody who's obsessed by taste or anything worth that that's what they're doing, they, they become like that, don't you yes. think? Yes, Because, yes. you see, they can't bear the second best, and you've got to be a martinet if you don't like right. the second best. Right, absolutely. Would you have liked to have been around when he was here to tell him yes. what, what you wanted? Well, certainly he'd have told me, wouldn't he? <laughs> 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 Brown's Park encompasses a magnificent 1,100 acres. His contemporaries were bedazzled by his vast plantations. Happily, the Duke and Duchess are united on the pleasures and problems of maintaining the park. Yeah. I think it's... The problem with trees is that uh, they do have a natural lifetime, but it is much longer than yours or mine. Right. And many people tend to regard a tree as permanent. It isn't, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, beech trees which are not long living trees by 180 years uh, or at oaks do for a very long time but they do have a life circle mm -hmm. and there comes a moment when they should be felled right. and that was probably important to plant young trees, young trees. all the time so that there's a continuous uh, right uh, uh, do, you, do you set yourself a limit do you think this year i will plant 100 trees or well we usually do about 30 uh, yes, do you? Yes. Yes. and uh, sunday evenings uh, we <laughs> very often drive by and say we need trees there and we need And how can you we, remember where you wanted uh, them? Yes. Oh well, it's yes. all in the head. It's all in the head. <laughs> it's very important in the head. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. You must get all your weekend yes. guests yes. to go and stand yes. in, yes. in yes. various places yes. in various yes. gaps. Don't being trees. You're keen. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> do you occasionally see a spot and think, wow, I'll have a tree there? Or, or, <laughs> yes. How do you decide which tree on its shape or its longevity? Well, if it's left to me, I like a lot of the same sort in one place. Yes, I don't think we uh, disagree on that. A, a clump of... Oh, no, we either put chestnuts or oaks. So there's one I like, and limes. oaks. Yes, yes. and yes. limes. Limes do very well here. Which, which were the first oaks you, you planted here? Can you remember? Well, we started as soon as we came, didn't we? Yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I thought 1950, years yes. So, probably... 35 yeah. years ago, yes. I think so. 30, 30, 30. And then that bit of park, called the old yes. park, which is the end of the Sherwood Forest. Yes. yes. It's, there's yeah. only oaks there, and we only plant oaks there. I that's wonderful. And, and if anything rogue comes up, do you take it Well, then it hasn't a chance with the dare and the sheep. I see. Well, there's nothing that isn't carefully tended or particularly. Really? Yeah. Really. So what are the oldest oaks there, do you well, think? Well, they are very old. I should think, well, 500 years, I think, would be a, a fair estimate. The English climate is usually pretty wet, and so you can have green grass and green trees. Uh, on top of that, although the Browns landscapes were very expensive to create, they were extremely cheap to maintain afterwards. At a more exalted level, I think you could say that these landscapes are the classic Arcadian landscape of trees, grass, undulating lawns, the green meadows of heaven. To us today, 
They recall the unspoilt countryside of our childhood. I like walking very much. I'm never a walker. Yes. And it is the most lovely place to walk. I used to walk through the perimeter of the park on Boxing Day every year, which I think is 11 miles. I'm afraid the last year or two uh, I've been less energetic, but that used to be my Boxing Day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never take the beauty of it for granted. Every time I come home, I get knocked over by what it looks like. And certainly the park is uh, sort of, you know, when you come out here, if things are worrying or anything at all, you just do feel better. Something about it. At Lord Exeter's country seat, Burley, he was to transform the grounds. The house had originally been built for Elizabeth I's valued minister, William Cecil. This is a great place, he was to write, where I have had 25 years pleasure restoring the monument of a great minister to a great queen. Burley House was Brown's lengthiest commission. <laughs> of the south front by several feet. He also built the greenhouse, stables and summer house, all in a similar style and all unmistakably brown. Amongst his fellow gardeners he was known as that great man. The ultimate accolade for a great man was an appointment as one of the king's gardeners. In 1758, no less than two dukes, eleven peers and one commoner signed a petition for Brown to become gardener at Kensington Palace. They were to be disappointed then, but six years later, Brown had been made surveyor to His Majesty's gardens and waters at Hampton Court. <laughs> established easy relations with the king, George III, and became privy to court news and gossip. His majesty suggested that he should improve the grounds, but he declined, out of respect to myself and my profession. He was paid £2,000 a year, which covered both the running of the gardens and his salary. Out of that sum, a hundred pounds was specifically earmarked for the raising of pineapples. His one celebrated addition was the Great Vine. In a good year, it yields 600 bunches of grapes. With the appointment came the use of Wilderness House. It's a charming Georgian building, and together with his wife and three children, he was to live there contentedly for the rest of his life. He ran his business so successfully from Hampton Court that eventually he needed to take on two assistants to help with the surveying and bookkeeping. He always provided his clients with a grand plan of the intended improvements. But the grandeur took a while to take shape. Don't imagine a freestanding clump emerged overnight. To achieve one, you started with an unsightly thicket, which forced the trees to grow tall and straight. And, only after 30 years or so of growth, was the plantation thinned out and the beauty of a free-standing clump revealed. Landscaping was an extremely expensive business. Brown arranged to be paid at three or six monthly intervals, and he drew up contracts to this effect. There were very few hassles. People trusted him. 
His account book tells us of a thriving business. Harwood cost over £6,000, Petworth £10,000, and Blenheim a substantial £21,500. But then, Blenheim itself was spectacularly substantial. Blenheim Palace was given by a grateful nation to John, Duke of Marlborough, as a reward for his victories against the French. It was designed by Sir John Vanbrugh, but it fell to the Duke's widow, Sarah, who survived him by 22 years, to establish many of the designs in the park. She had the grandest of grand parterres. It boasted flawless symmetry and had entailed the removal of 9,907 solid yards of earth and the digging in of 1,120 solid yards of dung. Of its type, it was a masterpiece. And many cannot forgive Brown and the fourth duke for dismantling it. Can the present Duke of Marlborough? Well, it was a pretty dramatic stroke, but uh, it was the fashion of the time. Um, looking on it now, I'm really rather relieved because the thought of having to keep up a military pattern today would be something colossal. Because it stretched as far as that oak tree, didn't it? Before? Yes, about 750 yards from the house down to near that oak tree. So he came along, dug it all up. We and grassed it over. I see. It, obviously, a certain amount was dug up, but the main principle was, was grassing it over and making it level and producing this enormous lawn. So you have this lovely view over the rolling Oxfordshire countryside w with this big, enormous uh, lawn in front of it where, incidentally, cricket is played um, at most weekends. How wonderful. Now, the cedars we see here, would any of those have been planted by Brown? Uh, the back ones probably were, the front ones certainly were additions done by, in my grandfather's time. And the same applies on, on the, the west side. Again, these, all these cedars here were planted by my grandfather. My grandfather did an enormous amount of planting. He planted nearly half a million trees in Brennan Park in his lifetime. So he was trying to reproduce in certain respects uh, what Brown did uh, in the 18th century. And I believe you're trying to carry on that tradition. I'm trying to carry it on uh, now so as to get the park back in the 20th century, uh, in the 21st century, to what it was intended to be by Brown when he came here in about 1760. I believe you have quite a long plan, 200-year plan. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I've definitely got a 10-year plan in, in view at the moment, but with ideas going a good 40, 50 years on. <laughs> Sarah, Blenheim's first duchess, was as keen as the present duke is to make Blenheim a showpiece. But she sacked her grand architect, Bambra. Thereafter, he believed the duke had left her £10,000 a year to spoil Blenheim in her own way. To enhance Bambra's bridge, Sarah determined to build a lake that was to be the finest and largest that was ever made. The plain truth is, it wasn't. It was dull, flat and uninteresting, and not at all in character with the house. What did Capability Brown do to the lake here? Well, basically what he did was to dam up the river Glyme, which throws through this valley. He put a dam and a cascade at the far end and created this large lake. I mean, it was a stroke of a genius, a masterpiece. And uh, the water is dammed in at the bottom, and then it was allowed to flood the whole of this valley. But what was so clever was, on this side, he left a small island. Yes, so when you that. come in through Woodstock, you have this wonderful view over the valley with this fabulous Bamber Bridge and this island there with, with the tall trees on it, which gives an incredible landscape. Making the finest view in England. Exactly, correct. <laughs> That's right. Of course, the, one of the difficulties here is the question of keeping the lake reasonably clean from silting up. It was last dredged in my grandfather's time. I had an estimate about 10 years ago for re-dredging the Woodstock poolside, and it was a horrific sum of money, 100,000 pounds plus. Uh, so when it has to be done in 20 years' time, I hate to think what it's going to cost. There is a reservoir act 
which means that every 10 years you have to have a certificate to say your dam containing your water is safe. Uh, well, when we were due to have it renewed about three years ago, uh, it was discovered there was a seepage. We were wondering why the lake didn't always keep as full as we imagined it should do. And, of course, there was this hole where water was creeping away. And uh, that was very expensive to repair that. How did you go about finding out where the hole was? Well, An enormous expanse. Well, you with water diviners and uh, people like that. And then we had, actually, we had divers go down. Mm -hmm. And they discovered where this fault was. And bunged it up. And bunged it up. And bunged it up, splendid. I find it quite incredible to think that this is man-made, don't you? Well, it is. It's amazing. I mean, he was a genius. It yeah. was a stroke of a genius to uh, think uh, and plan this. And it is uh, recognized, I think, throughout the world that this is a very fine piece of landscape architecture. Whilst Brown was working on the epitome of majesty at Blenheim, he bought for himself the manor of Fenstanton. The estate cost £13,000. The family never lived here, preferring the charms of Wilderness House. But Brown did become High Sheriff of Huntingdonshire. His popularity was such that when he sent his son to Eton, the pupils could immediately nickname young Lancelot Capey. Brown was cultivated by the aristocracy, despite his occasional direct manner. He was an unquestioned authority and believed his placemaking would supply all the elegance and all the comforts which mankind wants in the country and, if right, be exactly fit for the owner, the poet and the painter. Brown always looked for a peg for his capabilities. Here at Broadlands, the home of the Mountbatten family, he used the existing house as the basis for his remodelling. He enclosed the building in white brick and added the portico. He wasn't a grand architect. Lord Coventry once said that if you want grandeur, go to Blenheim, but come to Croom for comfort. He might have said it about Broadlands too. It is one of the few places where Brown designed both the grounds and some of the principal rooms. The overriding impression they give is that they are easy to live in. It's no wonder a contemporary could write of the value we in England put upon the designs of a Mr. Brown. Lord Louis Mountbatten started the custom of asking Broadland's distinguished guests to plant a tree. Their efforts will enhance the park for many generations. During his lifetime, Brown was not without his critics. This meagre genius of the bear and bald, they ranted, whose speciality was one eternal undulating sweep. But today we remember him by another epithet, Dame Nature's second husband. Towards the end of his career, Brown could refuse an offer from the Duke of Leinster for £1,000 just to land in Ireland, never mind look at his estates there. He excused himself on the grounds that he hadn't finished England yet. His talents were in constant demand. It was said that when he died, he would go on to remodel heaven. The end came suddenly on February the 6th, 1783. Brown was 67. His passing was mourned. And in his obituary, they wrote, those who knew him best were not able to determine whether the quickness of his eye or its correctness were most to be admired. It was comprehensive and elegant. Such was the effect of his genius, that when he was the happiest man, he will be least remembered. So closely did he copy nature that his works will be mistaken. Don't look for his monument, for it is all about you. With the passage of time, his stature has only grown.